But guess what? My mom told me not to worry because she had some blood work done and she doesn't even have the sickle cell trait. Oh. Isn't that good news? <laughs> But your sister... Stop staring at me. Weird. Okay, I don't believe your mom said that. Oh. Or else there's something else going on that I don't want to get into. You want to call her and ask her? Um, I would very much prefer to not call Hey, her. didn't you tell me you don't have the trait for sickle cell? Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Bye. I'll see you later. Okay, so she said, no, she didn't say that. She said she didn't have the disease. You already knew she didn't have the disease. I'm not talking to you. What? But how did you know that I was wrong? Well, if they were both her biological parents, then both of them had to have the sickle cell trait if your sister has sickle cell disease. I thought you said it was because her DNA was mutated. Uh, true, but not true. Let me clarify. Your sister's DNA didn't mutate. Your sister inherited a mutation from an ancestor from a long time ago. And we'll talk about that. The passing down of traits from one generation to the next is called heredity. And every trait has multiple alleles. An allele is a version of a trait. So example, for eye color, you could have the allele for brown or blue eyes. For petal color in roses, they could have alleles for red or white. And for hemoglobin type, you could have alleles for alpha or beta hemoglobin. Since your parents do not have sickle cell disease, but they have a child with sickle cell disease, that lets me know that they carry both alleles. How can they carry the sickle cell allele but not have the disease? Well, I said that they have both alleles. Alleles can be dominant or recessive. We symbolize them using capital letters for dominant alleles, and lowercase represents recessive alleles. And we call this combination of alleles your genotype. Your genotype could be heterozygous, meaning you have a dominant and a recessive allele, or it could be homozygous, meaning you have the same type of allele. Homozygous dominant if you have two dominant alleles, or homozygous recessive if you have two recessive alleles. Okay, and how does this affect them? Well, your genotype affects your phenotype, the physical expression of the gene. And if you have one dominant allele, whatever it codes for will always be expressed, usually. Ah, so everyone with a capital H will have normal blood cells. Yep. And in order for a recessive trait to be expressed, you must be homozygous recessive for that trait. Let's practice. So we'll let this capital B represent an allele for brown eyes that is dominant over blue eyes, lowercase b. Determine the genotypes and then use them to determine the phenotype that would be expressed. Okay, the first one and the last one are homozygous. Homozygous what? Oh, the first one is homozygous dominant. So the phenotype would be brown eyes. Yeah, and the last one is homozygous recessive, so it'll be blue eyes. And the middle one is heterozygous, so it's gonna be, uh, what, a mixture of brown and blue? No, um, if a dominant allele is present, the phenotype is gonna be brown. Absolutely. But you know, Makai, it's ironic you mentioned that it could be a mixture because dominance actually can work in three ways. Standard dominance is the most common where one allele is going to mask the other, but it could also be incomplete dominance, where if you have a heterozygous genotype for petal color in roses, you'll end up with a mixture for the phenotype with pink petals, or in co-dominance where both phenotypes could show up, say in spotted animals or even with blood types, AB. I'm still confused because if my parents' cells have the dominant and recessive alleles, shouldn't the dominant alleles have like overpowered the recessive alleles when my sister was conceived? Well, your parents' body cells have both alleles. Would their sex cells, gametes, have both alleles? Oh, no, they wouldn't. Right. When your mom's sex cells or her gametes were made during meiosis, these chromosomes and the alleles that were on them segregated and independently assorted. Therefore, her gametes either had the dominant allele or the recessive allele, but definitely not both. 
the same thing happened with your dad's gametes. And when the egg was fertilized that day, overnight, hush, that is what determines the genotype of the offspring. Wait, there's no way to know which gamete will be present? There's no way to know, but we definitely can predict the likelihood or the probability of the outcomes. We can use what's known as a Punnett square or a monohybrid cross to determine this. Make a box and we'll evenly divide it into four squares. We know their genotypes. Oh yeah, they're both heterozygous. And we'll put the alleles for parent one at the top of each square and the alleles for parent two on the side of these squares. And we'll combine the possibilities like this and boom. That means there's a 25% chance that their children will not have the sickle cell trait at all. There's a 50% chance that the children will carry the trait. And there's a 25% chance that the children will have sickle cell disease. But that's about genotype. What percent chance do these parents have for their children not having sickle cell disease at all? Uh, three out of four boxes had the dominant allele. So there's a 75% chance that none of the children will have sickle cell. Let's say both of your parents were carriers of the allele for lactose intolerance, which means they're heterozygous. We can use a dye hybrid cross to figure out the percentage of outcomes for both of these traits. Instead of two possible outcomes for each parent, we now have four possible outcomes, which means a total of 16 for their offspring. Stay with me. Let's use FOIL from your algebra class to determine the possible genotypes that each gamete could produce. We'll take the first allele and combine it with the first, then combine it with the outer allele. Then let's take the inner two alleles and combine them. And finally, combine this inner allele with the last allele, FOIL. And we do the same with the second parent. And luckily this time, it would be the same outcome. Make a bigger square this time and divide it into four long rectangles. And then cut across four times. And we're ready for our dihybrid cross. And we'll cross them like this. Oh my goodness. Oh, what, so man? Well, actually, it's actually easy. It's the same thing. Exactly. Everything that takes longer is not necessarily harder. Okay, so here we go. If these two parents were to have a child, what is the percent chance that the child will have sickle cell disease and be lactose intolerant. Um, so that would be homozygous recessive for both traits. Um, just that one box there. So that's one out of 16, um, 6.25% 6 chance. Great, great, great. So how about if we had- Mr. Mickens, honestly, I don't have time for that. Honestly, I don't either, but <laughs> there are multiple questions I could ask you all about this. But I do have an easier way to represent it, maybe. This is called a pedigree. What do you notice about it? Um, well, oh, the circles represent organisms that are female. Oh, so then the squares are the organisms that are male? Yes, and I'm glad you said organisms, because I'd like to remind you, this applies to more than just humans. We just happen to be using them right now. What do you notice about the shading? Oh, half shaded is like, the carriers, so heterozygous genotypes. So the fully shaded must be homozygous recessive. And no shade is homozygous dominant. Absolutely. Good. Well, Mr. Mickens, this has all turned out to be um, great birth control, and you didn't even know it. Right. I wish I could just have children alone and by myself. Well, some organisms can. Uh, here we go. <laughs> it's called asexual reproduction. Oh, how can I do You can't. But for organisms like bacteria, sponges, and many others, it's faster than sexual reproduction. It requires less energy, and you can produce more offspring. It's most reliable because you don't need another partner. See, that sounds cool to me. Yeah, but sexual reproduction, you know, brings about more genetic variation. It allows for desirable traits to mask undesirable traits like we learned today. And that increases fitness for evolution. Let's say, in your sister's case, if she could only reproduce asexually, her entire legacy is destined to have sickle cell anemia for life. Whereas with sexual reproduction, depending on the mate that she chooses, the chances of that being passed down could decrease and eventually could even be wiped out. Desirable and undesirable traits? 
That sounds kind of offensive to me. Yeah, like who decides if a trait is desirable or undesirable? Okay, yes, that is very subjective and has been used for the wrong reasons in history. But what if I told you, Abeni, that if your sister had been born in the right place several centuries ago, having sickle cell disease was actually a great thing. What? How could that ever be a great thing? Well, there's one thing that can select and has selected the traits that are desirable for centuries and beyond. It's nature. Nature can select or decide what's desirable and what's not. (laughs) Stay tuned. 